we are live. Good evening. I'm Ivan Zoot, and this is the Jatai page. It's Jatai International here at Facebook. I'm Ivan Zoot. I want to welcome you to this evening's presentation, to this evening's broadcast. Um, got a lot to cover, a ton of really cool information, and a little bit of a different program. If you have joined us here before on Facebook, here on the Jatai International page, uh, you know we love to share a ton of great stuff. If you are already a subscriber to Jatai Academy, thank you for doing that, and you know you've come to rely on us for an incredible amount of quality presentation and programming to help beauty industry professionals raise the bar, build their business, and do great things. If you're new to joining us here, welcome to this presentation, and if you have not yet subscribed to Jatai Academy, I want to welcome you and invite you to do that. J-A-T-A-I dot net on the web. Uh, that is the home of Jatai International. That's our website. And there's an opportunity on there for you to click and sign up and join Jatai Academy. We are putting out a ton of great content on a daily basis. Bing! Right there in your email inbox. You're going to be getting information from a host of great educators, barbers, cosmetologists, presenters in the industry. You know Jatai and Feather for sharp things. Razor blades, amazing scissors, um, a variety of other tools and things like that. Um, hang on a second. No, I'm getting a comment here, technical support advice. Are we good? I think so. Okay, we're good. All right, that means we're good. We just agreed we're good. Um, so you've come to know Jatai or Feather for sharp stuff. Um, today we're going to take a little bit of a different direction. I've shared things that are not necessarily shaving or razor haircut related. Uh, and we're going to expand the conversation a little bit in an area that I'm really excited to be talking about. For several years I've been talking about programming under the banner or the category of what we call healthy hair cutter. And it's the subject of health and wellness in the professional beauty industry. And it's really a kind of hot subject lately on a couple of fronts. On one hand, I think it's important because as beauty industry professionals, whether you're a barber, a cosmetologist, an esthetician, a nail tech, uh, with all of the things we do in our industry, we're working on people's health, their appearance, their sense of well-being. And I think our industry has expanded to recognize that a haircut's about making your hair shorter. A haircut's about making your hair appear more pleasant to you or to the outside world. But a haircut also has huge value and impact as it relates to your self-esteem, your mental health, your sense of health and well-being. And I think our industry is very tuned into a lot of that right now. Another side of that wellness conversation is about you, about me, about the service providers that on a daily basis are working hard to endeavor to provide these services for our clients. And I think if there's a theme to this presentation tonight, I'd like that theme to be, if you don't take care of you, you can't take care of them. And I think that's really the underlying message behind all of what I hope to share. I do have a cheat sheet. I do have some notes because I do want to be sure to cover everything we kind of hoped to address within the program. I do have comments up here on the screen that I'm able to see and watch as long as they don't stroll too fast. Uh, I'll be able to try to keep up with those as they go. So I'm looking forward to seeing that we can do that um, as well. But the theme is, if you don't take care of you, you can't take care of them. And in no particular order, I think we're going to go from more obscure down to very, very solid information. And in some of the promotions and some of the information we put out in advance of this, we had a, a flyer that was out there and it mentioned talking about um, carpal tunnel. It mentioned um, some other wellness things. They had breast cancer on there. And um, I want to start by talking about disease as it relates to service providers and clients perhaps in the professional beauty and barber industry. I think it's, it's an area of concern for many people and I want to be very careful uh, in the language that I use and in some of the things we talk about. And, and what I mean by that is this. I have a cosmetology license. Check that one off the list. I have a barber license. Check that one off the list. Uh, I have a great deal of experience as a presenter in the professional beauty and barber industry, but that's not really any kind of a credential other than my experience in doing it. And lastly, I am a certified personal fitness trainer. I have a certification from the American Council on Exercise in personal fitness training. 
I also have a specialty certification in senior fitness. And the senior fitness issue is an interesting one because as I got my fitness certification, one of the things I learned was that a lot of the challenges that we have in our industry, whether it's back pain, whether it is foot and ankle and hip problems, whether it is uh, some of the obesity and diabetes issues related to our eating habits, whether it's carpal tunnel syndrome and bad shoulders, a lot of the maladies that sometimes impact beauty industry professionals look very much like things that happen to old people. Um, so the senior fitness element becomes very interesting and very relevant because in some cases we have 30 year old individuals who've been in the beauty industry for 10 years who have a shoulder that's behaving like it's 65. And all of a sudden some of the conversations about exercises and health and wellness and durability in our industry become very, very relevant. So I am able to speak to issues of health and wellness as a fitness professional with that background in education. It's important that I mention I am not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV or here on Facebook. I am not a dietitian. So while my fitness education and qualifications allow me to comment on issues of food and diet and intake, I have to respect what are called limitations of scope of practice, which is the things I can and can't talk about. So I just want to kind of throw that out there as a sort of rules of the game piece of what we're going to talk about tonight. I also want to be very conscious of the fact that many times when we talk about many things related to health and wellness in our industry, there are folks out there who are offering opinion in a manner in which they present it as fact. And I really want to be careful about this. When I present what I know to be facts, I will try to clearly state that. When I share what I believe to be my own personal opinion and not a fact, I want to make that fairly clear as well, because I think that's valuable for you as an audience, and I think it's important to maintain my credibility as a presenter when it comes to things like facts and opinions. So I think we're good there. If you have questions on that, just get yourself typing there so that I can be answering some of those things or addressing them as they do come up. Uh, I think that's enough with ground rules. I want to jump into some of the content. The first thing I have on the list was this notion of disease and the idea of disease prevention. And in that category, um, I put down things, you know, cancers, um, heart disease. Um, I have good news and I have news. Um, and maybe some of the news isn't new to everyone involved. I'm going to grab a stool here because a lot of this video is going to be me just talking because um, there's not a lot of technical movement and things going on until later on in the program. Let's see if I can make a slight adjustment in the camera there. I got a new little clamp that's trying to work out really well. Okay, um, I guess news and good news. The news really is, or should be, the aha moment is too much of the subject of disease as it relates to issues occupational in the beauty industry you fall into this big bucket of, we just don't know. Um, you know, many times as we talk about the chemicals we're exposed to in the industry, whether it is hair color chemicals or straightening systems or airborne contaminants that could be even simple things like hairspray and breathing these things in, sometimes there are concerns about our exposure to these things occupationally. Um, and the real answer is, are these things dangerous for us? We really don't know. Many of us really don't want to err on the side of, well, I'll just take a chance. So we choose to be cautious. Things like rubber gloves. If you're handling hair color, if you're handling perm solutions and things like this, rubber gloves just make good sense uh, from a exposure prevention standpoint or category. Um, things like breathing masks, um, disposable masks to cover your face and nose when dealing in close proximity with these things. Do you need them? We don't know. Are they a bad idea? We can't say that either. Um, is that ounce of prevention idea something that at least gives people a sense of comfort? Perhaps it is. Based on that, I'm going to tell you, do what makes you comfortable. But I'm also going to default to the very important suggestion to consult a medical professional. If you are a beauty industry professional who's exposed to these chemicals occupationally, or if you have concerns with regards to the exposure for your customers, talk to a qualified medical professional. Uh, especially when we get into this category of hair color when pregnant, chemical services when pregnant, is this safe for me and my unborn child? The truth is, not my opinion, the truth is we just don't know. The answer is 
ask a medical professional. And I know from my own experience, if you ask a medical doctor or in the case of pregnancy, whether it's an OBGYN or whether it's a, uh, a pediatrician or if you have been previously diagnosed with cancer, you're a cancer survivor, congratulations, keep fighting, uh, or you're currently going through cancer treatment and you're interacting with an oncologist, any of these educated medical professionals, if you ask them these questions, I promise you, you can find a doctor who will say, oh my goodness, you're pregnant, don't ever color your hair when you're pregnant. You'll find a doctor who will tell you that. And if that's your doctor and his recommendation, you have the choice to follow that advice if you see fit. You're also going to be able to find a doctor who's going to tell you, oh, don't be silly, hair color's perfectly safe, you can color your hair while you're pregnant. I know a lot of people just went, oh, no. But the truth of the matter is, and later we're going to talk about hydration, the truth of the matter is we really just don't know. And a doctor is only able to provide you with information based on their own level of knowledge, their own education, their own continuing education, just like we have continuing education and research in the business. So we're going to dump it in the bucket of we just don't know. We're going to leave the responsibility in the hands of individual service providers or clients, and we're going to say, consult your doctor, because from where I sit and stand with a cosmetology license and even a fitness certification, I'm not qualified to really address those things in a big picture current medical way. I hope that's satisfactory to some folks. I know it doesn't answer questions, but at least it lets us know where we as an industry kind of have to stand. You know, I have heart disease on there with cancer, and in the heart disease area, I've got some great news for you. Real facts. We know that beauty and barber professionals have lower incidences of heart disease and live longer than members of the average population. Let that sink in for a little bit. We have less tendency in our industry to come down with things like heart disease, and we have greater life expectancy. We live longer. You know all these old barbers that are out there. These guys are in their 90s, and they're still cutting hair. Well, let's unpack that a little bit and ask ourselves what's going on. The question really being, what can we as beauty industry professionals learn from these facts? We know them to be facts. Less heart disease, and we live longer. Why? Well, number one, we work standing up. Working standing up on our feet forces our heart to pump blood vertically. Forcing our heart to pump blood vertically, like any other muscle that we work out, keeps our heart in better shape. It's attributed to longer life expectancy and less heart disease in barbers. Number two, and an important issue in our industry, haircutting, generally speaking, is low stress. If anything is going to kill you faster, going to make your hair gray, and going to make your hair... Look, I'm a barber. I don't got a lot of gray, and I still got hair. Here you go. Proof it works. I told you. Facts, not opinions. If anything's going to help you, lowering your stress level is going to help you live a longer, healthier life. Barbers are surrounded with people that like them. Beauty industry professionals are surrounded with people they get along with. Think about it. If you don't like your barber, if your barber is a jerk... You stop going to him, and you don't see him anymore. The only people that come to see a barber or a cosmetologist are people that like them. And that has a huge impact on our level of stress and how we go about our days. Another important element to consider in this category is the notion that barbers, especially older barbers, frequently will find an old guy in his 90s, maybe his children don't call anymore, and they live in another city, maybe his wife or spouse or partner passed away years ago, and he lives alone his life has purpose. And this is another example of the psychological aspects of how and why our industry is so good for us at the same time that it causes us stress and challenge. This barber, this old man, he's got to wake up every day. He's got to take a shower. He's got to get dressed. He's got to have breakfast. And he's got to be out the door and on time at 9 o'clock because people are counting on him. And when you have people who are relying on you, you have purpose in your life. It's another one of those arguments. Hey, anybody watching, listening tonight that is not a barber or a cosmetologist, you want to leverage a little bit of this warm, fuzzy, people need me thing? Go get a dog. Yes, 
Older people who live alone, who have a dog, live longer because they have a sense of responsibility and purpose in caring for that dog. That dog's not going to survive if I don't survive to take care of it kind of mentality. So bottom line, net, net, longer life and less incidence of heart disease. And if that's a good thing, that's a good thing. And the circumstances and situation of our industry is kind of what attributes that or makes that happen. Next on my list after disease, I want to go to allergy. And some of these things kind of dovetail together, but in the case of allergies, certainly we have people that have sensitivities to airborne contaminants, anything from hairspray to chemical fumes. Certainly we have people that have contact issues with the chemicals that we use. I said it earlier, rubber gloves are a must if you're going to be dealing with hair color. Uh, breathing masks are a must if you're going to be doing reactive chemical services like some of the modern straightening services, especially the ones that use chemicals combined with heat and they're putting all kinds of things into the air. Again, we don't know what the real risks are, but it can't hurt you to err on the side of safe and caution. And another thing that not enough beauty industry professionals think about is skin testing sensitivities to things. You know, back when we were all in beauty school, we were all required to perform patch tests. Remember, hair color on the inside of the arm like that to make sure a client didn't have a sensitivity? Are we doing these things? You know, from my own experiences in the industry, a short little story, many years ago, more than I want to tell you, I brought a brand of hair care product into my shop. Shampoos, conditioners, and styling aids. Not chemical service products, just shampoos, conditioners, and styling aids. I brought in product to sell up front, and I brought in large sizes to have at the back bar. I'm going on 30 years in the industry, and this particular brand, and I will not call them out by name, because they're a long-time brand in the industry, much beloved by many beauty industry professionals, this stuff, I was allergic to it. I shampooed a client and my hands and my arms broke out from my fingertips all the way up past my elbows. Nobody else in my salon had this problem. There wasn't anything wrong with the product. I had a unique allergy or sensitivity to this product. As soon as I used it, my arms swelled up, got red and blotchy and itchy and a horrible experience. And as soon as I stopped using the product, it went away. Perfect example of an allergic sensitivity to something in a product. You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know what product it's going to happen with. So patch testing, some of the things we're exposed to, if it's a new product you're introducing into the environment, it doesn't do you any harm to make sure it's something that you or team members or clients might not have a sensitivity to. And remember, just because you have it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be an issue for somebody else. So we want to be sensitive to some of the things we use in our environments from an allergy standpoint. Um, I don't have enough knowledge of, of ingredient science, but I can recommend to you uh, there are some great books out there. One that comes to mind, the folks from Milady, who probably made your beauty industry textbook, create a, have created a, a product ingredient glossary. And it literally is a book, alphabetical order, A through Z, of the ingredients that are found in beauty industry products, service products, chemicals, and whatnot. And it tells you what they are, what they do, why they're in there. And for people like me, it has them spelled, and then it has them spelled phonetically so you can pronounce them. Because a lot of times when you get to the back of a label, there's stuff on there that, you know what, I don't know how to pronounce. So it helps. Uh, so in the area of allergy or sensitivity, especially if you have a client that reaches out to you and says, Hey, hair cutter, I'm coming to see you and I am allergic to blah, 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 whatever it is. Now you know, hey, let's check bottles that we use on this client. Let's prevent a problem before we have a problem. So that's a little conversation on... Uh, allergy. I want to address now, I want to roll into what we'll call general wellness. And in the general wellness category, the couple of notes I have on here are number one, proper hydration. The expression we use in this category is treat your work like a workout. If you go online, if you go to Google and you type in hydration calculator on Google, there are several good websites that will come up that allow you to enter in things like your age, your height, your weight, and information about your uh, activity level, what it is exactly that you're doing, and it will tell you what is the recommended amount of fluid intake per hour in order to maintain proper hydration. I think you might be surprised about how much you need to drink. Now, I am frequently accused by my nearest and dearest family member, my wife, of not hydrating well and properly. And you know what? 
I hydrate pretty well and I hydrate pretty properly. One way I know that is I am constantly ridding myself of excess fluid, which is quite frankly, a very good indicator of how much fluid you're taking in. Because if you're not putting fluid out, you don't have enough fluid in. So the hydration calculators can be powerful tools, but everybody should have a water bottle in the shop. Uh, for those of you that want to go green instead of going here, go to a refillable. I actually have a really nice aluminum hiking bottle with a straw tube on it. Uh, very eco-friendly, very green. It's actually gray, but it's green if you know what I mean. Uh, so that I'm not using plastic water bottles and doing some damage to the environment while I'm trying to help my personal environment. So hydration's a biggie. Treat your work like a workout and be drinking a lot. Uh, next on the list is food. And this is the point at which you should probably click the stop button and tune me out and not listen to me because I have plenty of bad habits when it comes to food. Who am I to talk about food? But the truth of the matter is a little bit of education goes a long way to helping people with this. And what I tell people here is this. Our industry thinks that lunch is cold french fries eaten in the dispensary while mixing hair color. And we all know that's just not healthy and just not sustainable long term. So I think we need to be a little bit better about what we eat. And I've got a couple of core tips to help us in the beauty industry. Tip number one is hunger is not a surprise. You know you're going to be hungry at lunchtime. If you don't plan for hungry, lunchtime's going to show up. You're not going to have anything in the salon or shop to eat that's good for you. And you're going to be left with your choices. The little barber shop where I work part time. Oh, we've got a pizza place, we've got a Mexican place, we've got a Chinese place, we've got a Subway, and we've got burgers within, while I'm on lunch walking distance. And while within those businesses there are better choices, I can go next door to Subway and eat a veggie sub on uh, a flatbread that might have a lower uh, carb count to it as well, and I can do pretty good, and I can also go to the place on the corner and get a cheeseburger. And their fries are really, really good. And there's a huge difference in the calories and the fat content of those two lunch choices. But if I haven't planned, I'm going to wind up with one of those and occasionally I'm not going to make the better choice. I got to be honest with you. But if you brown bag it, not only are you going to take care of your physical health by eating better, you're going to take care of your financial health because fast food every day is a lot of money. And while we're talking about wellness, there's your physical wellness, there's your mental wellness, your mental health. We talked about stress and there's also your financial health. So there's a benefit there as well. Um, so number one, plan ahead. You know, you're going to be hungry. Number two, portion control. You know, I can remember, I am of an age in which I remember when French fries at McDonald's came in one size, French fries. That's all there was. It was a little white paper envelope and it had some French fries. Today, the little white paper envelope, I don't even think they do that anymore. They have like large fries, jumbo fries, and bucket o fries. And realistically, all three of those are more French fries than any of us need. I know. They're really, really good. But they're not really good for you. A little bit of French fries, great. Every now and then, Great. Every day, not a good idea. Portion control. Not only what you're eating, but how much of what you're eating are you eating. And another important element of this is not eating on the fly. Ties into your mental health. Can't take care of them if you don't take care of you. Block your lunch. Put that half hour spot in the middle of the day. Block it out in the book and take your lunch separate yourself from the hair environment, go across the street, go outside, go in the back room, close the door, sit quietly, eat your lunch, return an email or two, call the house, do the few things you need to do, but not only get that food break, but get that head break and get off your feet, relax, tone down, chill out. So then when you come back from lunch, you're better for you and you're better for everybody else. So uh, segregating the food becomes really important. The last thing on general wellness, and we're going to get more specific on this, I want to talk about exercise. We in our industry spend the time on our feet and we're running. Some of us, if we wear a fitness tracker on our wrist, we log huge numbers of steps and miles on a daily basis behind the chair. But the reality is that becomes your normal. And a high level of normal activity every single day is not the same as exercise. The American Council on Exercise recommends that adults get 
30 minutes of exercise five times a week for a total of 150 minutes of heart rate elevated exercise. Now that doesn't mean you need to go run a marathon. That doesn't mean you need to go do a spin class for an hour and, and kill yourself, but it does mean you gotta get your heart rate up a little more than normal. It means you need to move a little bit. Miguel, hey, how are you? Nice to see you here tonight. You chimed in, I'll say hello. Uh, not enough people are doing that, so when you do, I wanna call you out on it. Good to see you, thank you for joining us. Um, 150 minutes a week of heart rate elevated exercise. Um, brisk walking, running, if that's something you enjoy. Bicycle riding outside or a stationary bike at a level that is more than just wandering around looking at, is that Selig? Hello, nice to see you here. And uh, Tina, it's a rough job. It can be a rough job. We're trying to find out ways to make it easier, Tina. Thank you for tuning in. Um, but you got to get that exercise above and beyond what is considered your normal because our normal in this job can be pretty high to begin with. All right, I don't know what changed here, but all of a sudden I got everybody chiming in. I got Lori, I got Danny, I got Tina. This is awesome. Uh, good to have you all here. Um, so that's exercise. More specifics on exercise as it specifically relates to occupational issues coming up in just a little bit. You're welcome, Miguel. Thank you. All right, next thing I want to talk about, I want to get a little head to toe on you now, and I want to talk about some of the physical aspects of the business, specifically some of the aspects of the business that I deliberately sought to learn about to be able to bring this information to the beauty and barber industry in terms of how we help ourselves. I'm going to move the camera just a little bit. I want to get a slightly wider. Hopefully that's going to work. Um... Yeah, I can see more of me. I get a little more room. Uh, you can see the Clipper Guy banner back there. Um, let's talk a little head to toe. Let's start down and work our way up. And let's start with your feet. Let's start with shoes. Now, it's kind of funny because I participate in a whole bunch of the online chat rooms or chat groups for the hair business here on Facebook. And there's one in particular, I don't remember which one in particular, but there's one that a couple of months back announced that they were no longer allowing posts in the haircut chat website about shoes. They declared that the posts about what kind of shoes to wear in the salon were off limits and that if anybody posted about shoes, the moderators were just gonna delete the post immediately. And I thought that was hysterically funny. But if you've ever seen what happens when somebody posts about shoes, you understand why they declared that a subject that was completely off limits. The truth of the matter is, you can't tell somebody what shoes are best or right for them. I will tell you that the general answer is, wear appropriate shoes. Now, appropriate is a huge bucket that is different for everyone. I went to a class once and this guy went on this little rant one time about the fact that you should order this particular brand of hiking boots to cut hair in the salon. And I'm sitting here listening to him and forget about the fact that they were ugly and not appropriate for me cutting hair in the salon because they were just ugly looking boots. More importantly, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I tend to have some trouble with my knee when I wear shoes that are heavier. And I'm looking at this hiking boot and the thing must have weighed six pounds by itself. And I'm thinking if I put a six pound weight on the end of my leg about middle of the morning, like 1030, my knee pain is going to be so intense I'm going to be crippled. Bad shoe choice but it might have been a perfect shoe for him. Then there's the person that goes, I wear gym shoes. I wear, and I, that's me. I wear gym shoes. I wore loafers, black penny loafers, to cut hair for years in the salon. If I did that now, I'm a little bit older now. My knees got a little more mileage on them. Penny loafers with a thin leather sole on them with no cushioning? By 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I wouldn't be standing up cutting hair anymore. I'd be sitting down. So I'm a gym shoe guy. I make no excuses for it. You will see me on stage at the largest hair shows in the United States of America in gym shoes. It's okay. I'm an old guy. I need good comfy shoes. But not everybody is comfortable in gym shoes. Women, I don't know how you guys do it. You guys show up at hair shows in heels. And some of you walk around all day in heels. And you, you look sharp. You look classy. You look dressed up. And you're perfectly comfortable. I don't get it. I don't even want to try it. I don't want to think about it, but it's not for me to tell you you can't wear heels. I'm going to tell you to wear good shoe choices that fit well and are comfortable. If you want a couple of rules, I'm going to tell you spend a little more on shoes. Generally speaking, more expensive shoes are going to be better made, better durability, 
probably more supportive and more stable for some of the things we do every day. But the bottom line is, shoes are gonna be an important choice. Can we see you do a haircut on a real person? Joe, thank you very much for asking. That's not the subject of this particular program. And I acknowledge, Joe, I do a lot of work on a lot of mannequins. And the reason for that is several things. Number one, I got a mannequin sponsor that provides me with a ton of mannequins. Thank you, Mariana Industries. Number two, Mannequins let us do whatever we want. And frequently, I very specifically wanna share techniques and things that you may not have a suitable model for at the time. So that's my quick argument for mannequins. Yes, you'll see me do haircuts on real people. I do them every day in the shop. Anytime you wanna come in, sit in the waiting room and watch me cut hair, you have an open invitation, sit in a chair and I'll cut hair all day. And if you've got a couple of bucks, come on in, I'll cut yours. Back to our subject at hand. We started with shoes, good shoe choices. Underneath those shoes is the floor mat. Get a good floor mat. A good floor mat is not $99. A good floor mat's gonna cost you a few bucks. And a good floor mat's gonna have a 10 year warranty. A good floor mat with a 10 year warranty is gonna be prorated. Meaning if you go five years and it starts to curl or crack or lose some of its bounciness, they're gonna give you five years credit towards the new one. Against our dress code for gym shoes, I wanted to see what that was right there. You know what, I've heard that before. Tina, um, take the link from this broadcast when it's over, share it with your owner or manager. Um, I think we really need to expand the notion of what does and doesn't fit into a dress code in some situations. Um, there are a lot of plain black gym shoes, there's plain white gym shoes. I don't think neon orange running shoes fit into a lot of decors and environments. I'm probably gonna side with your owner or manager on that one, but then again, there's probably some shoe choices that are better. And if the owner or manager has a choice of, you know what, you can either not wear gym shoes or you can not be able to work more than another three years because then you're gonna be crippled and handicapped, well, easy decision to make. I think you know what decision I just told you to make. Back to floor mats. 10-year warranties, prorated floor mats. If it is damaged in some way, they give you credit, you get a new floor mat. Stand on that floor mat. The floor mat protects you, it protects your tools. A lot of good reasons to stand on a floor mat. The next thing I want to address moves away from feet and starts to move into our lower back and our mid back, our lumbar spine, our thoracic spine, and ultimately our cervical spine as we move up the back there. And that is the notion of chair height. Here's that mannequin you didn't want to see. Chair height. I see people all the time cutting hair like this. Hunched over, bent over at the waist. It hurts to watch them. Let's get that chair up. Let's pump up that chair. Let's work at a height that is best suited to the work that we are doing. In the case of barbering, and I'll put this in a barbering context because I think people can relate to some of this, if we are going to be working below the curve of the head in a tapering mode, look at me. My back is straight, my elbows are down, my shoulders are relaxed, and this is a comfortable position for me to work in. But if I were to go into layering at this height, look what I have to do. My arms are up and I'm all scrunched up and this is uncomfortable. So if I'm working over the top of the head, it becomes extremely important to lower down that chair so that I can now be at what is a comfortable working height. Look at me, my shoulders are relaxed, my elbows are in, my hands are at a comfortable height, and I can work through the top of the head in a much more comfortable manner. You know, when we talk about round brushes, and I'm not a big round brusher because when Ivan cuts hair, there's not enough left on the head for a round brush, but I can share with you a lot of physical issues as it relates to the use of a round brush. Round brushes can be wonderful ways to bend hair, but round brushes really take their toll on our bodies. Round brushes put an incredible amount of stress on the shoulder. What are some of the things you can do to reduce the stress associated with the physical use of a round brush? Well, as an example, change the chair height. By changing the height of the chair, we change the position of our shoulder. So even as we're working through different areas of the head, if I'm working low on the head and the head is low, my arm is down here. But if I'm working low on the head and the head is high, 
my arm is here. So perhaps even working low on the head, I want to make adjustments so I can change my arm position throughout a service to provide some stress relief on different points of the arm. There are round brushes with larger, more ergonomic handles. Sometimes it may be in your best interest to choose a round brush with a smaller diameter because a very large round brush that can hold a large amount of hair puts an incredible amount of stress and strain on your wrist. A smaller brush is easier to turn. To that end, another suggestion is when we're grabbing hair with a round brush, don't put all of the hair in the round brush. Subsection a bit. Put less hair in the round brush when you are brushing, do your sectioning, to be able to work with smaller amounts of hair because less hair in the brush will put less stress on your wrist and shoulder. So these are just some examples of how we can take the stress off of a service like round brushing. Another great one is rough drying the hair. If the hair has a lot of moisture in it, it puts a lot more stress and drag on the brush. So what if we take the blow dryer and knock out much more of the moisture ahead of time so the hair is much drier before we actually begin to go in with the brush. It's another great tip in that category. So adjusting chair height. Now let's look at hand position while we're in this category. We talked about clipper over comb and we talked about working below the curve of the head. This is what we call overhand position. Look at my wrist. My hand is over the clipper working below the curve of the head to clipper cut. As I come up the head, look what happens if I try to cut in the top of the head. Look what happened to my wrist. My wrist went from a straight position to an awkwardly bent position. So overhand cutting is used below the curve of the head. Underhand cutting is used above the curve of the head. Look now, I'm over the curve of the head, but I'm in underhand position, so my wrist is straight. Look what happens if you try to cut underhand under the curve of the head. Look what just happened to my body. Uh, elbow up, shoulders twisted, back jacked, ouch. Very uncomfortable. So the memory aid for this, if you're taking notes, is over, under, under, over. Over, under, under, over. Let's unpack that. Under the crest line, overhand, over the crest line, underhand position. Very important, critical to take pressure off the wrist and reduce stress at the shoulder. Let me run through my list over here. I don't think we could do a health and wellness program for beauty and barber professionals. I don't think we can talk about taking care of ourselves without talking about carpal tunnel, one of the great scourges of our industry. And obviously when we talk about carpal tunnel, we get into a scissor conversation because the scissors are a predominant tool in the beauty and barber industry. I want everybody get out your sock puppet. Hello. Hi. How are you tonight? That's my sock puppet, all right? I want everybody to get out their sock puppet. You don't have to have a real puppet. You just make your hand talk like a sock puppet, just like him. Now, I'm going to take away my sock puppet, and I'm going to keep my hand talking. I want you to have your hand talking, 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 and then I want your hand to stop talking. You were talking, and then you stopped. Look at your hand. Turn your hand over and look to see where your thumb is. If you're like me, my thumb stopped talking underneath my index finger. Some of you might be in the middle between your index finger and your middle finger. Very few of you will have your thumb underneath your middle finger, and none of you probably have your thumb underneath your ring finger. Try it, though. If your sock puppet stopped talking like this and your thumb was underneath your finger like mine, Try to move it all the way over to the ring finger and squeeze his mouth shut really tight. Right here it starts to hurt. That's called impinging your thumb. You're feeling pressure right there because you've moved your thumb over like that. When you impinge your thumb, you create stress at the wrist and you're going to feel it at the shoulder. It's called the kinetic chain. Remember when you sang the song, ankle bone connected to the shin bone connected to the knee bone? That's what's going on here. This ultimately connects to this and that's where we have our problems. So let's talk scissors. A traditionally opposed scissor 
as the thumb and finger ring in line like that. When I put my hand in there, look where my thumb had to go. My thumb is moved all the way over under my ring finger. This muscle here is very, very hard and tight, and this is causing stress at the shoulder and stress at the wrist. That's a traditional opposed finger grip. This is what's referred to as an offset grip. Now you'll notice when I get in on this one, where's my thumb? My thumb is now moved from my ring finger to underneath my middle finger. It's moved over a bunch. I've lessened the pressure right here. I've reduced the stress at the wrist, thereby reducing the angst at the shoulder. Now let's go step one step further. Now let's talk about a swivel thumb. Look where that thumb ring is. I'm going to hold that one up compared to that one. Look at the difference. Yeah. When I put that swivel thumb in my hand, my thumb has now moved all the way over under my index finger where my sock puppet was naturally talking. Now that's where I am. Look at the big gap here. I've opened up my hand. I've released the pressure on here. I've reduced the stress at the wrist and I've made my shoulder a happy place to cut hair. Some people swear by their swivel thumbs. I will suggest that if you haven't cut with one, you should try to experiment cutting with one. I think you'll very quickly achieve a level of comfort, and certainly swivel thumbs have a reputation for adding long-term health, wellness, and durability to our bodies for those of us that cut an incredible amount of hair. So understand what's going on with thumb positioning and how thumb positioning, that yeah, Tina loves her swivel thumb, many do, yes. Uh, know what's going on with that and how that can help reduce some arm and shoulder and wrist problems. Um, next on the list, and here's my real favorite category. This is what I love talking about. I actually teach this at hair shows all the time. I want to talk about stretching exercises for beauty industry professionals. I think it's a fundamental part of this head to toe conversation. And I want to share with you some stretching concepts that you can use tomorrow immediately to make this program valuable to you in real time in your real life. Here's what I want to talk about. Number one, I want to define stretching. There's two types of stretching we do in our industry. There is what is called static stretching and there is what is called dynamic stretching. Know that these two are out there. Know that they're different. I'm going to explain how they're different and I'm going to give you examples of them. Before we do the stretching demos though, I do want to quickly visit the disclaimer. The disclaimer is, hang on, I was told that swivel thumbs create bad habits. Any truth to that? Lots of people have lots of bad habits. I don't believe that I'm aware in any way that a swivel thumb has a tendency to cause bad habits. I'd love to know what habits in particular you're referring to because what a swivel thumb is doing is it's moving the position of your thumb and it's providing free range of motion to your thumb to allow you to do what you want to do. Now, when it comes to things like point cutting and where you position your hand to do some of these things, I just think it makes some things a lot easier and a lot more functionally natural and comfortable. I don't know what might be a bad habit that might come of that. Um, if you, Danielle, if you can expand on that a little bit, I'd love to know what you have to share and I can possibly offer some insights uh, with regards to that. Um, stretching, dynamic and static. Here's the idea. Dynamic means in motion. Static means not moving. Dynamic and static stretching are the stretches we use for when our muscles are cold or hot. And here's what I mean. Cold muscles will tear, pull, rip, or be hurt or damaged. Hot muscles, warm muscles, muscles that are warm from blood flow, circulation, and activity are more soft, more supple, and more easily moved and can do more things. So the important thing is warming up and stretching properly. I was in the middle of my disclaimer when I interrupted myself to talk to Danielle. I just want to circle back. A couple things. Number one, anything that hurts, don't do it. Nothing you do on a daily basis in our industry or in any exercise for that matter should hurt. If it hurts, stop. If you already have some type of injury, you shouldn't be talking to Ivan or a personal trainer. You should be talking to a medical professional. So if you already have some type of injury, if you've already hurt yourself in some way or are experiencing pain, stop. Don't do any of what I'm telling or I'm talking about or suggesting that you do right now. That being said, I haven't 
worked specifically with you, the viewer, the listener. So my recommendations here are going to be very general, and I'm going to suggest that you tread very carefully in entering into doing any of these things. So muscles are cold. We do what's called dynamic stretching when muscles are cold. That is stretching by way of movement. Let me give you an example of a dynamic stretch. Remember sock puppet? Remember sock puppet? That is a dynamic stretch for hair cutters. What does it look like my hand is, look at that. It's slow motion. That's kind of cool, wasn't it? Okay, what does this look like? This looks like cutting hair. Doesn't that look like this? Yes, that looks like that. So a great dynamic stretching through motion, dynamic stretching, a great dynamic stretch for hair cutters is what I call sock puppet. You do this in the car in the morning on the way into work. You do this in the shop before you get started, while you're having your morning coffee. You do this a little bit to keep you moving. This is going to get the blood flowing. It's going to get the muscles warm. It's going to get things nice and functional. A static stretch for your wrist, don't do this unless your muscles are warm, would be pulling your hand back like this for a count of seven, six, five, four, three two, one, and release, pull it the other way for seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. A static stretch like that would only be performed on muscles that are warm from movement. So dynamic stretching before you get to work, dynamic stretching before your day begins, static stretching, 1030 and 230, middle of the morning, middle of the afternoon, to keep blood flowing, to keep things nice and loose, to keep you nice and flexible. That right there, that's a dynamic stretch for your wrists before you start moving around brush and doing things like that. Those are dynamic stretches as opposed to static, static where you're holding still like that. So that's how we define the terms and that's when you use which one or the other. That's wrist, let's talk shoulder. What would it be an example of a dynamic stretch for your shoulder, somebody that's doing a lot of round brush blow drying, somebody that's doing a lot of hair cutting. We need strong, flexible shoulders. A dynamic stretch for your shoulders might be arm circles, just like that. Circles forward and circles backward. That's a great example of a dynamic stretch for your shoulder. What would a static stretch for your shoulder look like? Remember, only when muscles are warm, 10, 30, 2, 30 as opposed to the warm up in the morning. A static stretch would look like this. Pulling your arm across your chest, grabbing your arm at the elbow with the opposite arm and pulling it in tight across your chest to really stretch that whole deltoid area and that shoulder capsule really, really well. Pull it as tight as you can across and hold it there and hold it there. It shouldn't hurt. Just pull it and hold it like that. That would be an example of a static stretch for warm muscles. So I think you've got dynamic versus static, hot muscles versus cold. This can be done anywhere on your body. Think of your ankles. Ankle stretching. Hold on to a fixed object. You can't see this. If I step back just a little bit and make circles with your foot, that is an example of a dynamic ankle stretch. And a static ankle stretch where you go up against the wall, and you bend your ankle and you lean forward and you really stretch out that ankle joint, that's a great example of a static ankle stretch. So we can do this little game head to toe with all of the different exercises that we do. Um, so that's some stretching and it's the difference. So we covered static versus dynamic and a few good examples. I do have a lot more content for this and anybody's going to be on the East Coast, you're going to be at Premier Philadelphia, that's coming up in September, I think the week of the 22nd or something like that. I actually have a healthy haircutter class scheduled at that show in which I'm going to go into depth on some of these things, more so than we can in an online program here. Um, lower back and legs. Here I want to talk about some strengthening exercises because if we're going to be on our feet all day, our lower body from our core through our legs, our quadriceps, our hamstrings, our lower back muscles, our glutes, our abdominal muscles, this portion of our body that supports the weight and the load of who we are on a daily basis, these things need to be strong. Now, I've got a little four pound dumbbell. I've also got a, I think this is like a four pound weighted ball. These are real fitness toys, but you don't need these. Our salon is loaded with things like gallon bottles of shampoo, half gallon bottles of barbicide, 
one liter bottles of developer. We've got great stuff in the shop that has some weight to it. And by the way, if a half gallon bottle of Barbicide weighs too much, use a half empty half gallon bottle of Barbicide. It weighs half as much. See, this can be a fun little game. But let's talk about some exercises. For strengthening our hamstrings, that's the big muscle at the back of our leg, and our lower back deadlifts. Now, I think it's important that I mention, as we talk about this, in the world of fitness, when we talk about strengthening movements and weightlifting, lightweight, I'm not talking bodybuilder stuff here, lightweight weightlifting movements, it's important to get the movements right first before we start to load, meaning make sure you're moving properly before you add weight to the equation. So while I've got my little dumbbell and I've got my little weighted ball, I will tell you before we go there, we really wanna focus on the movement. So let's talk about a deadlift, and I hope you can see most of me in the camera here. Got that angle down a little bit lower. I'm gonna step back, I'm not that tall and I'm not that big. A straight leg, straight leg deadlift. Your feet comfortable width apart at about natural standing width, about the shoulder width. Imagine you were holding dumbbells in your hands or a bar across. You're simply going to go down and you're gonna come up. You're gonna keep your legs straight. You're gonna hinge at the waist. You're gonna keep your heels on the ground. Keep your toes on the ground with your feet firmly planted. You're gonna go down, pause, and come up. Maybe you'll do three sets of 10. Initially, with no weight whatsoever, simply the weight of your upper body or your torso. Over time, you can add weight. There's all kinds of weightlifters at the gym that are doing this with hundreds of pounds. It's not a contest. It's about being healthy and fit to take care of your customers for a long-term, healthy, happy, comfortable career. So deadlifting is, and we're gonna do it from the side here, down, and up, and down, and up. Over time, you can add a little bit of weight, even just the four pounder is more than enough, or two bottles of hair color developer is enough weight just to put a little bit of load on there, but first make sure you can do the motion well. The next issue is squats, and here we're talking about quadriceps, the big muscles in the front of your legs, glutes, that's your butt muscles, and your back. And form is extraordinarily important here. You wanna keep your weight in your heels. You wanna squat down. Now we have what we call goblet squats. When you're using a weight, like a dumbbell, held in your hand like this. Or you can use a kettlebell. Oh, are we losing our connection here? We're gonna come up on timing pretty quickly here. Um, so I'm just gonna finish squatting. Enough to know, good form, down and up. Keep your weight in your heels, down and up. Practice without weight, without load. Over time, as you get strong, the desire to add a little bit of weight to build even more strength through your lower body, but a solid lower body, glutes, quads, hamstrings, and core will support you and everything you do every day. And supporting you and everything you do every day is what Jatai Academy is supposed to be about. It's why we have the programming here. It's why you subscribe to Jatai Academy online on the web. J-A-T-A-I dot net. We are running out of time. We're knocking up on an hour here. And I think they cut us off automatically at an hour. I will make the commitment that we will do this again very soon. If you like and you think this fitness conversation, this health and wellness conversation, for haircutters is important. Please put that in the comments here. We saw several people saying they really appreciated this information. I think we could pick up and continue this conversation in a subsequent broadcast and make it a two-parter, although we've got a ton of other stuff we hope to share in other broadcasts. I'm Ivan Zoot, ivanzoot.com. That's my website. J-A-T-A-I.net is our home on the internet. You know where we are here on Facebook. You know where to find us, Jatai. Uh, international on Instagram. It is my pleasure to be here presenting and sharing with you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you being here and giving us the time to try to help you take good care of you so you can take good care of them. That was the theme and that's what we tried to deliver on today. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, for jumping in. Thank you for saying thank you. Y'all have a great night. Love ya. Bye-bye.